Do you wonder if you're the best version of yourself? This is the question we seek to answer in this podcast. We reveal information that helps you recover your health and become resilient. Modern life makes us fragile. Our diet, lifestyle, and environment set us up for failure. We do not accept this. We seek optimization. We strive to become dynamic. Hey, what's going on? It's Dr. Chris here, and today I want to talk about a huge topic, which is autoimmune disease. It's a huge problem and a complicated and nuanced topic, and I'll do my best to break this down to a summary. Currently, it affects over 80 million people. That's one in five people, which makes it more impactful than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. This is really the biggest threat to Western culture. There are at least 80 named autoimmune diseases, the thinking is just probably well over 100 currently. Some of the diseases are uh, organ specific, such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, while others involve multiple organs, such as uh, lupus. So, what is autoimmune disease? So, the definition is when the immune system mistakenly attacks healthy functioning parts of the body. The tissue attacked and the symptoms that develop determine the name of the disease. Autoimmunity is characterized by four components. First one is an imbalance between the effector T-cells, which turns on cellular defense, and then regulatory T-cells, which turn off that defense. So that imbalance exists, and you get an overreaction of the immune system. Number two is a defective elimination of self-reactive immune cells. So if you've heard of autophagy, that's what we're talking about here. Number three is a chronically alert immune system. And number four is widespread inflammation. So those are the four components of autoimmune disease. Autoimmunity can be also broken into three stages from sort of uh, least to worst severity. So stage one is you're producing antibodies, but you don't have any symptoms or you don't have any tissue damage. Stage two, you've got antibodies, and now you do have symptoms, but no tissue damage yet. And then as you go further down the spectrum, go on to stage three. Now you've got antibodies you've got symptoms, and you've got tissue damage. So what triggers autoimmune disease? Now, I just want to address the genetic thing first. You know, a lot of people will point to genes. The Internet will point to genetic factors. Now, that it does play a part, but it's a much lesser component to all this. So in our lifetime, we've cracked the genetic code, which is incredible, but kind of led to this mindset of biologic determinism that is not entirely accurate. It's really a combination of genetics and diet and lifestyle uh, choices that interplay, which turns genes on or off, uh, which is known as epigenetics, by the way. That's what causes autoimmune disease. So while you may have the genetic predisposition for a particular autoimmune disease, such as multiple sclerosis, it's really your environment that kind of pulls that trigger and determines if that's going to be an on or off gene. There is a book called The Tiger Protocol, an integrated five-step program to treat and heal your autoimmunity. And TIGER is an acronym for the five main lifestyle triggers. So we'll go over that now. So T is for toxins. I is infections. G is gut health. E is eat or what to eat or not to eat. And R is rest and rebalance. So I'll break those down kind of quickly. So toxins can include heavy metals, which can be from seafood or dental amalgams. Uh, It can come in the form of plastics, which are everywhere, by the way, because plastics interfere with cytochrome P450, which is an important part of detoxification in the liver. There are solvents such as nail polish remover, detergents, cleaning products. They can all trigger fragrances, you know, the stuff we clean our floors with. They can all initiate an inflammatory reaction. And, of course, probably one of the, the worst culprits in this country is pesticides such as glyphosate can be extremely inflammatory. I for infections, so with things like Epstein-Barr virus are highly associated with autoimmunity. A certain recent global uh, infection is known to have a correlation with autoimmune development. Things like tick-borne illnesses can trigger it as well. And then gut, so this is kind of the most important one really. So, you know, our bodies, they contain more bacterial cells than human cells, which is kind of wild to think about that we're Actually, our microbiome overrepresents who we are. We're kind of like a walking bag of bacteria. So you can develop, depending on your diet, 
dysbiosis, so a sort of misrepresentation of the good versus the bad bacteria that can trigger autoimmunity. But you can also have intestinal permeability. So uh, if you heard of leaky gut, which used to be kind of a fringy term, uh, well, it's now been accepted. Uh, that's what uh, intestinal permeability is. So your intestine is semi-permeable normally. It's supposed to allow things like nutrients through. But if the junctions between the cells is too great, it'll inappropriately allow bigger molecules such as food molecules to pass through and then you have intestinal permeability. The immune system will then notice that there's food passing through and attack it. A lot of things can affect this permeability such as toxins, oxidative stress, psychological stress is grossly overlooked that can actually gap the, the, those junctions. Antibiotics, NSAIDs, additives from processed food, foods, they can all negatively affect that membrane. So moving on to E for eat, this is just as big as the gut maybe. There's a lot of overlap, overlap here. So a lot of people develop food sensitivities, intolerances, allergies uh, from specific foods, and this can be due to the pesticides or it can be due to the weakened immune system. There's also molecular mimicry, which is basically a case of mistaken identity when your body starts attacking its own tissues because it looks like a pathogen. And then we come to R, rest and rebalance. This to me is like the low-hanging fruit. This is the one that somehow gets overlooked the most. I mean, this this is sleep. We're talking about mostly sleep. Uh, most people are grossly uh, sleep-deprived. We're all staying up, looking at blue light, looking at cell phones, keeping us awake. Stress messes with our cortisol melatonin cycle, so it allows for having difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. So it's, it's really like our culture has led to this sort of chronic stress state, and that's partly to blame. But it also has to do with disrupted circadian rhythms. So, you know, as I said before, too much blue light expo- exposure and not enough sunlight. I mean, we've unfortunately been told the sun is bad for us, which is just not true. Uh, on top of that, you know, a lot of people try to solve stress by adding more stress. Like, oh, I'm stressed. I'm going to go to the gym, work out hard, you know, maybe work out twice a day. And sometimes we got to pause and just say, you know, I need a break. Okay, so what do we do about all this? Okay, I see this as a two-pronged approach. First, you have to identify triggers and eliminate what you can. And then on the other side of the coin, you have to make the person, the human, as resilient as possible. So, for example, uh, you know, if you think mold may be a trigger, you got to get tested for that. There's a simple test, by the way, called a VCS test. I think it's $15. You can do it online. Uh, it's when you are exposed to mold and it's affecting you negatively, you uh, lose the ability to perceive contrasts as well, visually. So you can do this visual test online, and it will give you a good indication of whether you're being exposed to mold. And there's also a biotoxin illness survey. You can do that online as well. It's free. Between the two of those, it gives you a good idea if mold is an issue for you. Then you could do things like eliminate as much plastic as you can, replace all your plastic Tupperware with glass, ditch the plastic straws. Just don't put plastic in your mouth as much as possible. Start thinking about how much metal you may be exposed to. I mean, if you're eating sushi for lunch every day, and tuna in particular, that may be a lot of mercury. Blood work is probably a really good way to start. It's a good screening tool, kind of casts a big net. So comprehensive screening uh, will sort of tease out if you do have some chronic infection. There's a lot of markers, such as CRP, will tell you if you are in an inflamed state. And, of course, there's tests for your gut as well. There's all kinds of breath tests, stool tests that you can do to determine if there is a gut issue going on. And by the way, you can have a gut issue and not have gut symptoms. If you do have gut symptoms like constipation, diarrhea, that's a pretty good rule in that you have a gut issue. But just because you don't have that does not mean you can rule it out. When it comes to foods, you know, I think an elimination diet is a good place to start. In fact, there is a physician by the name of Dr. Terry Walls, W-A-H-L-S, she uh, She's all over the internet. She's got some podcasts that you can listen to. She's got a fascinating story. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She's a medical doctor, was treating, uh, got to the point where she was wheelchair-bound, and then through a diet uh, that she came up with, it's called the WALLS Protocol, she went to remission. Now she's running, you know, riding a bike, back to basically full function. So check her out, Dr. Terry WALLS. And then when it comes to making the human more resilient, I mean, this is all the stuff that we know we should do or shouldn't do, right? You know what to avoid. 
Don't smoke cigarettes. Don't drink too much alcohol. Get a, a, the right amount of sleep. Mitigate stress as much as you can. Start identifying what things stress you out and, and, and start chopping some of that out of your life. Don't get into internet debates. You know, stop. Maybe stop watching the news. That's what I did. If you have people that are kind of toxic in your life, maybe you need to question that relationship. You have to have a movement practice in your life. You know, so too much exercise can be an issue, but for most people, it's not enough movement. So you can start as simply by tracking steps, shooting for at least seven to eight thousand steps a day. It doesn't have to be ten thousand necessarily, but Use that as a starting point just to find out how much you are moving. Get outside more. Get some sunlight exposure. Uh, there's, a, there's an app called Nature Dose, which will, if you have your phone in your pocket, it will track how much you're actually outside, and it can be a little bit terrifying, honestly. Dial in your sleep, right? So avoid stimulants after, I don't know, lunchtime. Avoid blue light at night, so don't be on your phone playing words with friends. And if you just can't get away from it, wear the blue light blocking glasses, um, I did uh, put together an ebook on sleep optimization. I'll put that in the show notes. It's a free download. And then, of course, uh, improve your, your flexibility, your physiologic flexibility. So this is something I've talked about a ton. If you listen to my podcast, this is exposure training. You know, maybe start off with some cold showers, some sauna, do both. You know, get, get that temperature, temperature swing up and down. So many of us live in this uh, temperature control climate at all times. That makes us kind of weak and fragile. So you need to make yourself more robust by exposing yourself to different temperatures. And if you really want to take that to the next level, you can check out our course, Physiologic Flexibility. That's our flagship program. That's all about becoming the most robust person you can be. So I think that pretty much sums it up. I'm sure I forgot a few things here. But the short of it is test. Find out what it is. Find out your triggers. Eliminate them to the best of your ability and then make yourself as strong as possible so you can tolerate those exposures that you may have. So that's all for this week. I'll be talking to you guys soon. A ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are meant to do. What does this mean? It means exposing yourself to difficult situations so you become resilient. If you need help building resilience, check out our flagship program called Physiologic Flexibility. This is a three-month do-it-yourself program that teaches you how to maximize your homeostatic regulators, such as your pH, blood glucose, O2, and CO2 tolerance, and temperature. We give you specific action items through the program with a goal of becoming anti-fragile. If you want to become the inspiration for your friends and family, this is the program for you.